Please put your hands together for Mr. Mike McGee. A haiku to start. I am Mike McGee. I love women and free food. <laughs> Running makes me sad. <laughs> it's true. Now, I have the luxury of not enjoying running. But I was born with spina bifida. And those of you who don't know what that is, it is a, a neural tube defect. It's a birth defect that, you know, it's a spinal deformation. And most people with it can't run. Usually in wheelchairs, they need help with mobility. I don't. I can, you know, karate chop. I can't kick very high. Though. Now, because of spina bifida, I do have a certain amount of nerve damage, basically between my nipples and my knees. And that nerve damage affects my bladder. It doesn't work at all. I have no bladder control whatsoever. Not a drop of it. I wear diapers. I've worn diapers my whole life. 37 years of diaper changing, I'm pretty good at it. Now, I'm pretty comfortable now with wearing diapers, but I wasn't as a kid. As a kid, it was tough because kids could hear them. Whenever I'd walk through school, they'd hear my diapers, and they'd find out about it, and I was Catholic, so I couldn't lie about it, you know? <laughs> so I would explain to them what spina bifida was, and they just weren't having it, and they thought I was a freak, and they would tease me. Diaper boy! Really original. We moved a lot. And everyone came up with Diaper Boy. <laughs> Times were tough. I mean, not too tough with my family. You know, I've been chubby my whole life. My mouth has been high-fiving food since 1985. <laughs> but being teased so mercilessly through school made it really tough. And one day I came home crying. One time, one time only, I came home crying. And my mom grabbed me and she said, Michael, if you're going to survive this life, you got to make them laugh with you and not at you. She was right. Right then and there, she gave me permission to be hilarious. <laughs> but I was still pretty bad at it. I got into eighth grade, and I was just as mean, as ruthless as everyone else. I avoided public swimming pools, locker rooms. The idea of being seen in my diaper was like foreign. It was impossible and unacceptable. I couldn't do it. But the meanest people in school were these rich kids in eighth grade at Hoover Middle School in San Jose. They would sit on this grassy knoll near the cafeteria and they would just bestow insults upon everyone. Especially the poor kids. I was considered a poor kid. So I thought, well, I need a team. If I'm gonna take down these kids, I'm gonna need a team to help me out. So I rounded up all the funniest kids in school and we sat at the bench between the cafeteria and the grassy knoll. And we aimed all of our insults at the rich kids. Every once in a while, kids would come out of the cafeteria and they'd get hit too. Sort of a little sit by shooting, you know. But it was working. And it made the rich kids hate me even more. And I was fine with that. These John Hughes bastards. And we would mess with everything about them as much as we could. The gel in their hair and their new kids on the block conversations. 1989. Right? So, all of a sudden, the spring of 1990, pantsing became the thing. Pantsing. And my crew, we were the clowning crew, all got pantsed. And we were trying to figure out how was it that everyone that I liked was getting pantsed. And it turns out that the rich kids loved the idea of pantsing. But there was no way they were ever going to touch the clothing that was bought at Kmart. So, they had a hired gun. And his name was Corey. Corey was the fastest kid at Hoover Middle School. And the reason he was the fastest kid was because he was the skinniest kid. The reason he was the skinniest kid is because he was easily the poorest kid at school. He got free lunch like us at the cafeteria. We couldn't understand how the rich kids lured him in. He had principles. And then one day, we figured it out. 
The rich kids lured him onto the grassy knoll and made him pants people by raiding their cupboards and pantries at home, food they knew no one would miss, and they'd fill his backpack with groceries to take home to his family. It was the only way to get him to do it, and, and he did, with efficiency. He was of the wind. He could pants anyone. By the time you knew your pants were around your ankles, he was gone. And he probably had your wallet, too. He was so good. And there's no way I could outrun him. And that occurred to me one day. I was like, oh, I'm going to be a target. There is no way the rich kids aren't going to make sure that I get pants. My clowning crew grew nervous. So for days, we tried figuring out a way to avoid me getting pants. Because if I get seen in a diaper, it will be the end of my life from here on out. So we tried figuring this out, and there was just no way around it. Because my wardrobe consisted, literally, of three t-shirts and four pairs of sweatpants. Sweat pants. A cloth made of the finest dryer lint and hope. Pants made for pantsing. I was so scared. It was going to happen. There was no way around it. I couldn't outrun Corey. He, a tiny, very hungry cheetah, <laughs> waiting for a buffet, and me, a fat, lazy zebra, really just ready to be a buffet. So, I knew it was coming. The day came. I woke up one warm June morning knowing it was going to happen. I went to school like nothing was going on. I got my free lunch. I stood outside the cafeteria and I kept my eye on Corey. The whole school kept their eye on us. They knew it was coming down. My clowning crew was nervous. They knew it was going to happen that day. I stood there, kept my eye on him, thinking, if I can see where Corey is, I'm safe. There's no way it's going to happen. And if it's not going to happen, then that means I've won. Maybe I've already won. And by the time that thought hit my brain, I felt two bony handfuls <laughs> of sweatpant being tugged down by Corey behind me, the ninja pantser. <laughs> I looked down to see the elastic of my sweatpants around my ankles. I had been pantsed. Corey and the rest of the lunch crowd looked up, expecting to see me in a diaper. But instead, what they saw was a second pair of sweatpants. <laughs> It didn't work. I couldn't believe it. Corey couldn't believe it. I looked back at him. We just smiled, knowing that we had both won. He rose to his feet, shook my hand, walked up the knoll, claimed his groceries one last time. I eyed the rich kids. They knew we had won. There was nothing they could do about it. I returned to my seat, claimed my spot on the bench with my clowning crew, knowing that Corey and I were the winningest losers at Hoover Middle School, class of 1990.